Uh, welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Peter Bergen. I uh, run the National Security Studies Program here. Um, it's uh, with a lot of pleasure that uh, I introduce Saad Moseni, who is an old friend of the New America Foundation. Uh, as many of you know, he's been described accurately as um, Afghanistan's first media mogul. Uh, he runs many networks in Afghanistan and, and in also in other countries like Iran and Pakistan. Uh, he is widely regarded as being <coughs> one of the most knowledgeable uh, commentators on Afghanistan and um, like me, uh, he's a relatively small group of people who is quite bullish about Afghanistan's future. Uh, so we were going to we're, we're going to have a conversation um, between ourselves and then open it up to Q and A with you. Um, and so, Saad, first of all, give us a sense of what your business is doing, why you're uh, optimistic about the future, uh, and um, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, it's great to be here and to see uh, your organization, you yourself, so engaged in Afghanistan and our region. It's always good to, to be back here. Um, we, we um, as, as you know, we established uh, our businesses in 2003, and uh, they've grown from a small radio station to a, a group that now is made up of 15 or so media companies. We employ close to 1,000 people. Um, and our business has grown consistently over the last uh, almost 10 years. Um, and the advertising market in Afghanistan is, you know, from sort of under a million dollars is now $100 million plus ad market. Still relatively small, but for a country like Afghanistan, with all our problems, it's grown significantly, which has allowed us in turn to also expand regionally. Uh, for us, the economy, I mean, it's, it's, we are seeing some weakness, and I think a lot of companies are fearful of what may transpire post-2014. But overall, I mean, I, you know, I think that if we can get over a number of obstacles, which I'm sure we'll discuss, um, I'm fairly optimistic about the, features, uh, the country's future and its prospects. And um, how has Tolo TV been sort of received? What's your market penetration? Tell us a little bit more about the, the actual business of Tolo TV. Well, Tolo TV is our, our, our main um, channel. We have uh, three uh, television networks. We have Tolo TV, we have Tolo News, and we have Lamar, which, which is in Pashto, and two national radio networks. Uh, Tolo has something like a 50, 55% market share which is significant given that there are 60 or 70 other television stations in the country. Uh, media has been a huge success for the country. Something like 65% of the population watches television at some stage during the week. Um, and uh, it, you know, it has really helped uh, the country in terms of facilitating social change, uh, informing and entertaining the public. And even the role of, inter you know, we, we often talk about corruption and all the problems that Afghanistan has. Media is probably the, uh, the, the, the outlet that people actually go to. Um, it, it sort of allows uh, Afghan society to let off steam. So for, it's, it's something that we, it's been an exciting journey for us. Um, but it's, it's one that we can look back and say it's been one of the big success stories of the country. I mean, relative to every country in the region, from Turkey all the way to sort of South Asia, Afghanistan seems to have the most liberal, the most open media environment. That's not to say we don't have our challenges and problems, but it's been an extraordinary success. Also, if you compare it to you know, relatively recent Taliban, uh, relatively, relatively recent Afghan history, uh, under the Taliban, there was voice of Sharia radio, and that was it. So not only is it unusual for the region, it's very unusual in the, Afghan, the recent Afghan historical context to have this explosion of media yeah, I mean, uh, uh, telecommunications, for example, we had just under 10,000 phone lines in 2001, and today we have 18 million mobile phone users. Uh, same with media. We, have, we had one outlet, which was the state broadcaster, uh, just the radio, no television. And now we have 60, 70 odd television stations, hundreds of radio stations, literally thousands of newspapers and weeklies. So it's been a huge change from 2001. What about some of the series that, that you've done, Eagle Four, the kind of Afghan Yes Minister, Afghan Star? Talk about these series and what they have presented to the Afghan people. Well, the Afghans, I mean, we've seen a huge change in terms of people's, uh, the demands of our viewers. 
you know, in, in a place like the States, the, where the market is mature, people's tastes change over time. And Afghanistan is fairly, dr it's fairly dramatic. You know, uh, first couple of years we were actually broadcasting Indian soap op operas were popular, and then we we had to go to uh, to buying a lot of Turkish content because people related more with the Turks than the Indi Indians. And of course, we've also had to develop a, a, a lot of our own programming in terms of formats, whether it's uh, sort of uh, Afghan style, which is uh, like the American Idol, or we have Deal or No Deal, which is the exact format that you see in the States. We've just uh, uh, secured the voice for Afghanistan. And then, of course, we have a lot of our own formats, which we've developed, uh, like On the Road, which is a, a travel show, and uh, Eagle Four, or we have this. What is Eagle Four? Eagle Four is about this elite police unit that's not corrupt and it's effective and it's not predatory. So it's a unusual Afghan police unit. Yes, but it, you know ho the hope is, is you know it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's quite interesting that a lot of police officers watching the show are motivated by the show. But at the end of the day, these are entertainment programs, and you know all the ultimate aim. Although we'd like to change the way that people see things, it's it's uh, ultimately to entertain people. And when you started, did you take U.S. government funding? Yes, we did. We started off with a very small grant from USAID um, when there was no advertising in, the, in Afghanistan. And we, we actually, we weren't even certain it was going to work uh, for the radio station. And um, they came in with some money. It was a couple hundred thousand dollars, and we put up $300,000 of our own money. But then we, when we saw it working well, then we put up uh, quite, quite, quite a bit of our own money to expand the business. And it's since then we've had another grant from from USAID. But I mean, it's 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 an example of how you know pub public private partnerships can work well in a pr in a place like Afghanistan. What are the sort of red lines uh, culturally about the kinds of uh, series you can produce, and what are the kind of red lines politically about the stories you can cover, or is that not relevant? Well, we have to be always very mindful of uh, social co and cultural conventions and religious issues. We've made mistakes. I mean, sometimes we do push the envelope. And what are the mistakes? I'd rather not discuss them, <laughs> but you know, there have been many, many. Um, you know, for, for example, the language that we used, uh, the sort of colloquial everyday language on the radio, which wasn't, we, we felt that uh, people would relate to our DJs uh, when we first launched the radio station. That was not acceptable, so we had to go back. And I mean, we had, for example, a uh, an award show uh, for, for for our sort of version of uh, of the Golden Globes or the Oscars. And uh, someone clever came up with the idea of you know having some background dancers who are Afghan, although they were, had their heads covered. But that uh, was was unacceptable, and we had to go and apologize to parliamentarians. And so we, we have. We have made mistakes in the past. And who do you um, who do you have to respond to? I mean, is there a kind of is there some kind of board that oversees media in Afghanistan, or is it the Supreme Court? Or who's who's got kind of, if you do step over the line, who do you hear from? You can hear from anyone. You can hear from Parliament. You can hear from from the ministries, from the prosecution. But Karzai has commented with you about some of your programs, right? Yes. Directly. What do you, what was the most recent interchange you had with him? Uh, well, I mean, technically, there's a commission which is headed by the chaired by the Minister of Information and Culture, and they review. It's a media complaints commission that deals with any complaints against the media. And then, if they cannot resolve the issue, then it's referred to the to the prosecution. But sometimes the prosecution takes the initiative and they start investigating things, uh, or you could be summoned before some parliamentary committee. So we've had a lot of issues in the past. We have something like six or seven cases outstanding in the courts. Um, and, you know, but, but, you know, we're finding our way, and so is the government, in terms of mm -hmm. dealing with these issues. So it's now conducted in a more orderly manner than it was, say, four or five years ago. And <coughs> if, you're caught, if, a, if you have a case in the Afghan judicial system, I mean, is that a kind of neutral exercise, or is that highly dependent on who the judge is and who they're being influenced by, directly or indirectly? Yeah. The, it's, it, it has a lot to do with the judge, it has a lot to do with the prosecution, it has a lot to do with who in the office of, of the president is talking to them. Um, now for us, because we're a media organization, uh, corruption is probably not an issue, but for a lot of other people it's about, it's about uh, the price, who's willing to pay more. 
Right. Um, and uh, it's an issue that we, you know, we deal with and everyone else is dealing with. I mean, ironically, uh, as, as you know, we, we're, we're all finding our way, even the judges within the system now, uh, you can expect a relatively fair hearing on a lot of these cases. We're trying to resolve a couple of uh, the outstanding cases I've been dealing with for the last five or six years. So the Afghan judicial system, in your view, is more professionalized than it was five years ago? Yes. But starting at a very low bar? Yes. Um, I mean, don't forget a lot of the judges had no, you know, basically a lot of people <coughs> who came in in 2002 had no experience um, within the judiciary. So they're finding their way. Um, but slowly, I mean, I think that this is, this is how things improve um, with uh, time. Rupert Murdoch has taken a minority stake in your company. Yes. Um, what is your relationship with him and, and why is he doing that? Well, I mean, News Corporation uh, is, a, is an international company. Uh, unlike uh, NBC and others, 50% uh, of its business is, uh, comes from outside the U.S. They have been very active in Asia with uh, Star and Say uh, in India and, and, of course, in China, Indonesia, and those sorts of places, and also now in the Middle East. So I think that they view that for them to continue to expand the business, their business, they need to be in all these new markets, and for them, we are, present this opportunity. Uh, you know, as, as we're going into newer markets, uh, markets that will grow substantially in the coming decades. Uh, I suppose they want to have a stake in it. I wanted to recognize Tom Freston, who's sitting in the front row, who's uh, a member of the National Advisory, uh, National Security Studies Advisory Council, and also was on the board and was sort of a mentor of yours uh, when you were starting the company. Um, He's still a mentor. <laughs> Um, and Tom uh, was uh, the founder of MTV. Um, you're in a sense sort of, you know, start, starting something equally creative. Um, do you think people in Afghanistan, um, are, are you widely admired? Are you, do you have a sense of, of that? Well, it's difficult to say and uh, it's important uh, not to care too much. I think it's important to focus on what we're doing and we're going to have our supporters and, and detractors. Uh, the most important thing for us is, uh, is to basically open up the world to, to Afghans. I mean, it's a business, but we also care about our country and our people. We actually care about the region. And uh, I don't know, history will judge as to how well we went. And what about your uh, ventures in Iran? Well, we launched the channel there in uh, 2008. Um, and. Um, it's, uh, you know, we opened up satellite television to, you know, it w actually there was, there was satellite television before, but we pretty much introduced um, uh, good entertainment to, to the Iranian public. And, um, you know, we've had our challenges. Uh, are you doing that out of Dubai or where, where are you? Well, technically we're doing the uplink from Europe. It's a fairly complicated, uh, we do the dubbing in one country and the translation in another country and the editing in one country and sales in another country. And how do you, uh, I mean, are the, is the Iranian regime trying to block your programming or how, you yes, they have, how yes. do you circumvent that without getting into too many details? Well, they've tried to uh, uh, interfere with our signal. There are various ways that they interfere with, uh, with satellite signals and uh, they intimidate advertisers. And they've arrested people who work for us. Uh, Past and present employees. In, in Iran, they've arrested people. Yes. Yeah. But sometimes people go back or they quit yeah. and they go back after six months and they're still hassled. The Iranian regime is obviously understandably very paranoid. Um, and they, you know, up until a few years ago, they had a monopoly in terms of the airwaves um, and the eyeballs, Iranian eyeballs. And for them, they've lost that monopoly. And, um, you know, understandably, they're very paranoid. Switching now to sort of the political future of Afghanistan. <coughs> Do you think Karzai, I mean, there's a lot of discussion in Kabul that Karzai is trying to set something up and, you know, essentially remain the power behind the throne, a sort of Putin Medvedev type deal, or that he'll bring in a brother maybe, or that he's going to fix it in some way. Yet all his public declarations have been, you know, I'm leaving, I'm retiring. What faith do you have that he will go quietly into the presidential retirement? Uh, or do you think he will want to stay in the game? And, and could he fix, I, as I understand it, the Afghan constitution doesn't allow you to have three consecutive terms, but it doesn't say anything about having a third term later. 
Um, it's, uh, well, you know, we don't know. I mean, we have yeah. to take his word for it. I, I think, you know, at this stage, he, he's genuine in terms of his, um, his, uh, his wish to just walk into the sunset and allow for someone else to come in. But I think as he gets closer to 2014, he will be mindful of, um, of his family, of his tribe, of the different business interests that people who are closely associated with him have in the country. So he will be, he will be reluctant to, I would say, if I was him, I'd be reluctant to just walk away from power without ensuring that his interests are safeguarded, even his legacy, you could argue. So he would probably prefer someone friendly coming into the palace. But I think as, you know, if he mentions it often enough and the international community continues to sort of move forward in terms of ensuring that the elections take place, that we have a smooth political transition, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think it's so important to, to ensure the elections take place, that we have fair and free, or at least credible elections, yeah. that the right candidates emerge, uh, that we have an environment that people that do step forward if they want to run for office. And I think that, you know, Karzai, and, I've, and I'm in favor of ensuring that, you know, we don't have a situation post-2014 that people basically, um, uh, you know, have a go at the, the, the uh, former president for personal reasons. I think that he should be given a degree of immunity, and, mm. um, not a blanket immunity, but I think that we have to give him some guarantees. It, it, it's, in, a, in a hundred years, I think, uh, We'll forget about some of the minor issues, but we will remember a smooth transition. It will define the country for the next few decades. Absolutely. And do you think the measures are, I mean, it seems to me that we, the United States government has put a lot of eggs in the reconciliation basket and it hasn't really produced mm. anything. But as yet, and maybe this has begun to change, very little effort in the highly predictable 2014 election <laughs> and making sure, as you say, credible enough that uh, you know, when we look back 50 years from now, it will be seen as a major milestone. I mean, what needs to be done for it to be credible enough? And are those measures being taken? Well, uh, you know, quite often, because we've seen this in, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, you know, there's a disconnect between what Washington wants and what people in Kabul uh, do on a daily basis. For example, with the elections uh, today, with the elections, the, 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 mon the, the commission that handles the elections in Kabul, so they're dealing with the U.S. Embassy. The U.S. Embassy is reluctant to offend Karzai. Um, so they tend to insist on things uh, that, that Karzai is after, whereas people in Washington have a totally different view. But the problem is that if we don't deal with some of the major challenges, like, for example, monitors, independent monitors, or, for example, the, the ability of the commission to decide as to where we have ballot boxes, um, then we're not going to have free and uh, fair elections, and therefore we will not have credible elections come 2014. <coughs> For example, in the south and, uh, and the east of the country, um, parts of the country where we're not going to have security, it should really be up to the Elections Commission to decide that we're going to have ballot boxes there. Because if we don't have the security and the monitors there, it's going to be impossible to, to ensure that we have, we, people are not going to stuff ballot boxes, something mm. that's happened before in the country. But people say if the embassy in Kabul insists on a guarantee that we will have ballot boxes right across the country. So these are s small things that we have to ensure. I think that someone, almost in Washington needs to um, deal with these sorts of issues going forward. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think because if we somehow emerge from, from the elections and people believe, and some of the political players believe that they've been cheated out of an opportunity to, to win office or, you know, um, as a member of a team that, for example, la the last elections, I think the results will be fairly violent potentially. Yeah, the one way to kind of guarantee a precipitation of renewed civil war would be a horribly flawed election, right? Yes. Where, um, so you do think that people are aware of this and making the right decisions to prevent it? People are aware of it, but I don't think people are make the right, making the right decisions because people tend to be very myopic. Uh, if you have a, a diplomat, whose tenure is going to end in June 2013, he's going to worry between now and then. Yeah. Or if you have a special envoy for a particular country who, who's aiming to run for a big office in Europe, he's going to be more concerned about emerging from Afghanistan unscathed so he could go and say that he was successful in Afghanistan and vote for me to be the next prime minister of XYZ country. I mean, these are real, you know, these are real... Yeah 
stories um, about individuals who are currently engaged in Afghanistan. So this is the problem that we have. They're fully aware of the pitfalls, and yet they have their own ambitions and they have their own reasons for doing certain things. In the last you know, quite flawed <coughs> presidential election, how did Total TV cover that? Well, we tried to be as, as, as free and fair and, and uh, as transparent as possible. I mean, we were the ones who first did the, we had the footage of the, the ballot boxes being stuffed uh, from all sides, actually. And we questioned what the, the commission was doing. And we were very aggressive in the way we pursued uh, the, 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 the flawed process and the way it was being handled. And, um, as a result, we, you know, our relationship with the government de deteriorated, but we had to do the right thing. I mean, uh, for us, it was a no-brainer. Going um, forward to the coming election, who do, who do you think are, will be the big names that will be in contention, and which, and which parties will be important players? Well, Afghanistan is one of those countries that I think almost every single Afghan uh, has ambitions of running for office. Uh, <laughs> so we have, we have, you know, I think everyone is testing the water right now, but if one was to categorize just, you know, uh, the, the different types of candidates, we have, we have Pashtuns within the state who, who've been, you know, who were former Mujahideen, affiliated with different jihadi groups, who are close to the president. Um, I think the chief of staff, uh, Dawood Zai, for example, or uh, Farooq Wadak, the education minister, these sorts of candidates are very interested in running for office. Um, you have technocrats, Western educated, uh, people like Ashraf Ghani, or Ali Ahmad Jalali, and others who would have an interest in running for office. But last time they did, they either didn't run or they did terribly. But, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're very hopeful that things will be different now. Right. Um, you have uh, the non-Pashtun, Northern Alliance types uh, who may run. I mean, he, they may feel that there's an opportunity for them, especially if the Pashtuns do not come out to vote because of security or because of apathy. Um, you have people very close to the president, his brother, and, and some of his key friends and allies. Uh, this is Kayum. Kayum Karzai, I believe, and, and a number of other people who are very close to him that are <coughs> his trusted friends. And then you have others, you know, like we have a, uh, other uh, former Pashtun ministers, people like uh, Hani Fatmar and, uh, and uh, uh, Mirai Siosini, who was a deputy sp uh, speaker of the, of the House. So we have a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good bunch of people who are interested in running for office. Your uh, media organizations don't do endorsements? No, we don't, no. Um, in terms of the economic, uh, economic mm. sort of outlook, I uh, have seen figures that suggest that in an optimistic scenario, Afghanistan's economy might contract by 12% in the sort of, as the aid and foreign forces mm. come out. The uh, non-optimistic scenario is 40%. Now, a 12% contraction was the size of the Great Depression in the United States. So even in an optimistic scenario, you know, this could be pretty rough. Um, you mentioned that you're, you are you already seeing that in your advertisers, or is there any, uh, you know, and, and how do you assess um, the sort of post-aid Afghanistan economy? Well, it's a, it's, that's why it's so important to, to, again, work with the Afghan government in terms of ensuring that uh, the right things are put in place for the development of the private sector. I think that there are a lot of opportunities have been lost um, in terms of developing the agricultural sector, for example. Um, you know, we, we still don't have a lot of electricity. I mean, this is something that's been 10 years, and the question a lot of Afghans ask is, uh, would it have been so difficult to construct uh, three or four uh, hydro plants, for example? Mm. Uh, we have, the roads have improved significantly, but more could have been done. So there, there are some, some uh, you know, we look back and say that, you know, we could have done more. But at the same time, I think Afghans are very resilient. They've survived and conditions that we could only imagine, uh, in, certainly in the 90s. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you may be surprised in terms of how resilient we are. Uh, but I think most of it is psychological. I think that the, we have seen the numbers drop off in terms of advertising, but I think it's just uh, companies being preemptive, being concerned. Um, we haven't seen an actual, uh, any real signs in terms of the economy contracting, but I think it is it is 80% psychological, and I think that's why it's so important that 
if the message is that we're going to continue to remain engaged, that we have plans in place to ensure the economy doesn't just collapse, um, then I think that uh, the, 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 the landing will be a soft one. Who are your big advertisers and what sort of sectors? And, and related to that, which businesses are doing well in Afghanistan? Clearly the telecommunications, the media, is there anything else? Well, you know, the, the, uh, the FMCGs, the, the, you know, the Unilevers and Procter and & Gamble's and others, I mean, they're selling a lot of products. I mean, they're for them, if you look at the, the products and how they sell, you know, in terms of the sales uh, quarter by quarter, the, 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 the growth has been phenomenal the last few years. Mm. Uh, again, because they've come off a low base. Uh, we're talking about the bottlers, for example, Pepsi's gonna start bottling very soon. Coca-Cola's been hugely successful in the country. Um, uh, the banks, although we had a banking crisis of sorts a couple of years ago, they're sort of beginning to come back. But there've been some enormous op you know, opportunities lost. I mean, one of the, the areas that we've struggled to kickstart is a boom in the construction sector, for example. Mm. The banks still can't issue mortgages. We still have problems with our land titles. Uh, I mean, no economy can develop with a, without a boom in the, in the building sector, as you very well know in the States. And for example, this sort of opportunity has been lost uh, in the country. So these, these are simple things the international community can do in terms of working with the Afghans to, um, to, to ensure that we have a, a fairly stable two or three years post-2014. How would you score uh, the surge <coughs> of 30,000 troops? I mean, uh, it was designed to blunt the Taliban momentum. It was, I think, secondarily designed to bring the Taliban to the table. And um, thirdly, kind of buy space for the Afghan government to kind of get its act together. If, if out of those three um, kind of goals, uh, which ones were achieved or partially achieved? There's absolutely no doubt that it had an impact. And I think the impact uh, has been a positive one. I mean, what we expected and what we got are two different things. But in terms of the situation before the surge and the situation afterwards, and for us to look back, if you look at Helmand, you look at Kandahar um, in particular, you know, the, the changes uh, have been significant in terms of, you know, there's more security, there's more activity, the, the Taliban are a lot less in, um, influential than they used to be. What, where we failed, uh, you know, when I say we, um, uh, it includes all of us, um, you know, we were not able to really fill that vacuum with a credible, honest um, government uh, that wasn't predatory, for example. But still, despite the, 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 the problems that the Afghan state has had, it's, it's been a success. Um, and, you know, we've had seen other things like, for example, people rising up against the Taliban in parts of the country, in the east, in Ghazi, in those places. That, those that, that seems to be very undercovered in the Western media. Yeah, but it's been significant because we've been following these these stories. I mean, these people have you know have risen up not just against the Taliban but also against the state. Right. But leave us alone. Uh, um, we can take care of things. And then in the north, for example, in Kunduz and Baghlan, you've had you have local militias, which have you know in, in a place like Kunduz, although we had some some bombings recently, but in terms of their influence. Uh, in the province, uh, they, they have, I mean, the, the Taliban have been eradicated in, in, in a province like Kunduz, which is such an important province. Are, are these um, ALP, I mean? Uh, yes. Okay, so Afghan local police that yes. is basically set up by U.S. special forces, because yes. there's been a kind of controversy about this, that somehow these were going to be were arming the next wave of the civil war by setting up these local militias. They could still do that. I mean, this is yeah. the concern that we have. I mean, there have been stories about rapes and intimidation, yeah. and these are things that we've covered. So the flip side is that the, although the Taliban have been pushed out, uh, you know, you, have, you are creating militias that could potentially endanger the, the country. You know, when, when you talk to the people involved in setting up these local mm -hmm. militias, there are certain safeguards that make them a little bit different from militias of the past. You know, it's all kind of the Ministry of the Interior kind of have to sign off and the village council has to kind of mm -hmm. elect the right people and they're not given heavy weapons and these kinds of things. Do you think that has, I mean, has this program basically worked? Or is it sort of too early to judge? Or well, you know, we've had issues. As I said, there have been a number of uh, high-profile uh, incidents where women have been raped and people have been beaten up. But I think overall, I mean, the jury's still out. It's it's a bit early to judge in terms of the safeguards. Who knows? I yeah. mean, if they work or not. What about the Afghan National Army? I mean, you know, compared 
If you go back to Iraq in 2007, you know, the Iraqi army was capable of taking on large-scale operations without much any U.S. support or any U.S. support. Mm -hmm. It's pretty obvious that the Afghan National Army isn't there. Are they just going to collapse like a house of cards in you know, 2015, or is there any reason to presume that they'll be able to kind of sustain? You know, I mean, don't, don't underestimate the Afghans and their ability to fight. As long as they have money and as long as they, they, they get their paychecks uh, and they get their food uh, on a daily basis, they will fight. And I think they will prevail because the situation, the difference was that the Taliban were being actively supported by the Pakistani Fauji, by the Pakistani military at the time. Um, and, and the Afghan uh, forces, which, you know, the, it wasn't the Afghan National Army, it was a bunch of jihadi groups, totally discredited amongst the people. So the situation is a little bit different, but a lot will also depend in terms of the psychology at the time. If they feel that the, the state's about to collapse, you will see people abandon the Afghan National Army. But, I, you know, I, I'm quietly optimistic. I think that there's, you know, the Afghans will do it their own way, but I think they'll be effective. And I think in some ways they'll be a lot more effective than the Americans because they understand the culture, they'll adapt, they'll work things out with the villages and, and the elders and uh, you know they will be superior in terms of you know if you compare them to the Taliban I mean uh, I don't think the Taliban force will I mean we've seen different numbers but I would say it's somewhere between 10 to 20,000 men right would uh, would you know on the AK AK-47s you have the Afghan military that will have helicopters will have heavy weapons it will be well into six figures potentially with the uh, with help from the US and its international allies. So it's going to be, it's going to be difficult for the Taliban to prevail. What sort of help post-2014 should the U.S. and its allies be offering? Um, I mean, in terms of, I mean, we have the strategic partnership agreement until 2024. Mm. You know, I was surprised during the vice presidential debates, Vice President Biden said, we're leaving Afghanistan in 2014, period, and he repeated it. And I mean, the U.S. government's gone to quite a lot of trouble to negotiate this agreement, suggesting the United States will mm -hmm. be in Afghanistan for another decade after 2014. So what should that post-2014 -Ameri post American presence looks like? Um, what is it, you know, if it was in your dreamer vision, mm -hmm. um, and what do you think, what do you assess is the likely uh, kind of uh, post-2014 American presence? Well, I think it's important to note, first and foremost, I mean, if we look at the glasses being half full, and one of the frustrations we have with the Afghan government, it doesn't really reflect the views of the, the Afghan public. I mean, if you look at the situation today, 10 years after the war, the Afghan public remains supportive of, of international forces and international engagement. As, as a matter of fact, they're concerned, deeply concerned about a total abandonment of, of, of the country. I think the numbers I've seen range between 15 and 60 percent in terms of the approval rating of the international forces there. And Afghanistan is a different place. I mean, we, uh, you and I talked about this a few weeks back in Dubai that you know, something like 30 odd percent of the population is, uh, is literate today, which is a big change from 1978 where literacy was at 8 percent. But what's even more interesting is that if we keep the number of students consistent at our schools, we will uh, uh, overtake Pakistan in the next decade. And our literacy rate could get up to 80 odd percent in two decades. I mean, that's an enormous change from today. You're talking about a population, 60 percent of which is under the age of 20, median age of 17. Uh, Afghanistan is becoming urbanized very, very quickly. Something like half the population now resides in, in major cities and smaller towns. And that's really important because, you know, once people are city dwellers, they stop, you know, the tribal and sectarian affiliations are no longer relevant. And in the big cities, I mean, women have to work because it's difficult to survive. So you're seeing a lot of women enter the workforce. Um, and Afghanistan is, is, it could become a model for, 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 for the entire region. I mean, the most basket case of all the countries in the region becomes the most progressive. But in, but in terms of the American presence, is it important that the United States keeps, you know, 5,000 troops in Afghanistan, 500, zero? I mean, what is the, is there a, is there a kind of psychological number that would um, sort of say to the Afghans and, and also to regional, the neighbors, that, you know, the United States is here to stay and we're not abandoning mm -hmm. Afghanistan as we did in 1989? 
The question is, I mean, for the Afghans, if it's going to be 2,000, then the Afghans will say, well, we're going to alienate our, our neighbors and upset people within the country. And, but with 2,000 people, you're not going to be able to do much. So right. that, that, in some ways, could be counterproductive. But I think that the numbers that people have talked about range between 10 and 20,000. Um, but the numbers the Obama White House is really looking at now is much lower than that. I mean, it, they're looking more in the three to 9,000 range. And it's possible they might say, you know, my understanding is 3,000 would keep Bagram open, mm -hmm. and that might be enough. Well, we don't know that. But I think a lot will depend on in terms of the conditioning of the Afghan public, just like yeah. they're trying to condition uh, the U.S. public. I think it's important for, for people to understand it, for it to be explained. But in my discussions with the military, uh, senior military people, both here and also in Kabul, Amer American military uh, officers, the feeling is that we need to have at least, in order for us to right. do what we wish <laughs> to do, we need to have 10 to 15,000, which would include international troops as well. So it may be a combination of both. Right. I guess if the United States says we'll provide eight mm -hmm. and the other seven will come from mm -hmm. other NATO countries, that's plausible. But I mean, I'm telling you that I think that the, mil the, the mil U.S. military's desire and what the Obama White House mm -hmm. is willing to approve, I think, are very different. Well, I think that's why, but, but people, I mean, this, this is, uh, I suppose, one of the we're seeing these sorts of debates go on probably in Washington right now as we speak in terms of what numbers, uh, you know, the, the residual forces post-2014. Uh, and also the drawdown right now. I mean, how many troops will you withdraw immediately? Uh, and then, you know, and the drawdown in terms of the numbers uh, as we approach the end of 2014, that's also going to be important in terms of building capacity within the Afghan forces. But of course, the residual forces are going to be very important in terms of the psychology for the entire region. But I think one of the things that is, you know, Americans need to think about is that this has been the longest war for the U.S. You've spent hundreds of billions of dollars in the country. Um, if ensure, in, you know, and the damage to the credibility of the U.S. in the region and internationally uh, is going to depend on 3,000 extra troops that needs to be you know, taken into consideration. One final question before throwing it open to the mm. audience. Um, how would you score uh, what has gone on in the reconciliation front? I mean, I just read today that there are apparently 30 or 40 countries that are in some form of talks with mm. some elements of what they think are the Taliban, which obviously is pretty confusing. Um, and obviously, the United States and Afghanistan and Pakistan, there's a degree of sort of mutual distrust, mm. which makes a kind of a deal any kind of deal difficult. On the other hand, Pakistan's released you know, a number of uh, kind of Pakistani Taliban figures that will be important to a, uh, a negotiation. Um, Afghan Taliban who are living in Pakistan. So how would you score all that? And is it, I mean, you know, the history of these kinds of negotiations suggests that they're very lengthy. I mean, think about the British and the IRA. It took 30 years. Mm. Um, so do you see this as something that's desirable? Do you see it as something that's actually producing any results? Do you see the Taliban uh, producing any kind of explanation of what they see their, their own future in the system in Afghanistan to be? Well, you know, we're talking about a force that uh, its approval rating has never really exceeded 10%. Right. You know, we have seen the Taliban in power in Afghanistan. We know what they're capable of doing. So I think people are very reluctant to support them wholeheartedly. And if anything, in some, some provinces and some districts where they have prevailed, it's Mostly, it's been out of fear, and also because the people, the, the government has been so bad that, you know, the people have resorted to bringing back the Taliban. But the key thing for us is, I think that both sides are not being particularly honest. All sides are, you know, I think the Americans are dece deceiving themselves to believing that we can have a quick peace deal. The Afghans probably think that they can divide the different leaders within the Taliban, um, and they will prevail by promoting certain individuals within the. Uh, the, the, the Taliban leadership uh, hierarchy. And then we have the Pakistanis who are probably just buying, buying time. The Taliban themselves, I mean, why would I do a peace deal if the Americans are leaving in 2014? It's just, it's a no-brainer. I mean, no one disagrees with the principle of, of talks. Uh, you know, every conflict has ended in some sort of a negotiated settlement. But if I was a Taliban commander, why would I want a peace deal? The Americans are leaving. I mean, the biggest supporter of the Afghan army, the, the people who've been doing the fighting are leaving. So why would I want a peace deal before 2014? 
in my humble opinion, I think that what will happen is um, the time is on the Taliban side, as they often say. But quite the reverse is going to be true post-2014. Every single day after 2015, the Taliban have not prevailed in major towns and major districts and major cities. Their myth will be destroyed. I think that the Taliban will, st the, the, the pressure will be on the Taliban to do a lot more post-2014. And every single month that they haven't done enough, they'll be weakened psychologically. I think the real peace deal will happen in 2016, 2017. That's one. The second thing is that the Taliban, you know, pretty much, I mean, for me, if I was to do a deal with the Taliban, I'd do a deal with them at the regional level, yeah. not the, at the national level. Because their policies and their ideology is not something that resonates across the country. So if there's a prominent Taliban commander, I'd put them, I'd make him a district chief in Helmand or a governor in Kandahar. You know, you don't have to do something. You don't have to dilute the entire system because of a force that has an approval rating of 10%. And the question right. to a lot of your government officials is why are you imposing a force that's so unpopular on the Afghan nation? Um, and I, I think a lot of people, again, in, in your government are motivated by things like a Nobel Peace Prize and so forth and or credit for ending this, this war. Uh, and I think that they have the wrong attitude and the wrong approach. This, this is a very complex issue. I mean, you could make the argument, there is an argument for withdrawing all international troops at the end of 2014 because it would basically take away the sort of stated reason the Taliban are fighting the war. Well, they fought. Uh, prior, uh, before 2001, and there were no international troops in the country. Right. Um, that may be true in some districts and some parts of the country where uh, people don't have a good view of the American troops, but I think nationally it's not true at all. And you think, I mean, I, when I've talked to Dr. Abdullah on this question, I've asked him, yeah, what could you live with? I mean, it, it sounds like your views and his views about the Taliban are similar, which is district governorships where appropriate, maybe a governor, uh, you know, di a, a, a provincial governorship where appropriate. Well, they're not qualified. I mean, you're not talking yeah. about very sophisticated people. Yeah. So uh, why would you hand them a ministry or, a, uh, you know, they're, they're going to screw it up, basically. Uh, even if they had the best of intentions. So what you would do is you quarantine them at the, at, the, at the regional level. It's a bit like buying a very small company and doing a deal with them at the holding company level. I mean, you, you do it at a, at a very regional level. And I think that they may do a good job at the district level. Who knows? Great. We'll throw it open to questions. If you have a question, uh, can you raise your hand and identify yourself and wait for the microphone? So this lady here in front. <coughs> Hi, Peter. Um, this is Mehreen Farouk from Word, uh, the World Organization for Resource Development and Education. I wanted to thank you for um, providing us with this really great opportunity. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, we're leading a study on Afghanistan <coughs> civil society, and um, you had mentioned earlier that a lot of your TV programs um, have been critical in facilitating social change. Um, so I'm particularly interested in the capacity of civil society to promote peace and stability in the country. So I was wondering if you can um, share with us some examples of efforts or programs that are underway or in the works to sort of amplify moderate voices around the country. Well, we have, you know, we have seen a lot of, uh, uh, let's call them movements, uh, so, uh, predominantly led by, by young Afghans. Um, some are supported by the likes of Soros and the Europeans and others. And some, some just, just young people uh, uh, putting you know, their efforts together and, and making things happen. But what's interesting about the media and how we work well with civil society groups and individuals is that we allow them, we give them a voice and a platform. Um, and the, the continued support of civil society is going to be very important for the country. B b to, to an extent, they are the conscience of, of our country today. Um, and especially some of these young people that are very encouraging in terms of their views on uh, on women, on, on education, equality for all Afghans. A lot of young people are coming forward talking about private sector development in the country. And you know, even if you look at our uh, round tables, you know, you see so many young people today commenting, you know, on, on different types of issues. So there are hundreds of different organizations, civil society groups active in the country. Some are funded directly, some are funded indirectly by, by the U.S. government. Uh, but a lot of them are just young people wanting to do the right thing. We don't have the challenges that say the, the 
people in Russia have or people in Pakistan have. You know, to an extent, Afghanistan is c quite free in allowing these people to, to, to operate. And Gentleman behind you, Daniel. <coughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Larry Cohen. I'm going to speak on behalf of one of your Tolo TV advertisers and a former sponsor of Afghan Star. That's okay. You mentioned that the, uh, if I can quote you, no signs of the economy contracting. However, I can speak on behalf of this company that the impact of the transit trade agreement and the interruption of transit trade has had a devastating effect on their company and on others. Mm -hmm. I would say that perhaps the economy is already in the process of contracting because of the interruption of trade. How do you uh, address that? No, I, I did say that you know, we, we have seen um, signs that companies are cutting back on some of their costs. But there's no doubt. I mean, we've had problems in terms of transit for 10 years now, uh, especially with Pakistan. Um, Wait, explain what that means. Well, uh, whether it's with, the, uh, with contractors uh, bringing in goods for, for uh, for the American military, no, 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 or, or, no, I said whether whether it is that or um, Afghan produce going in another country, we've had a lot of challenges, um, and a lot of ships shipments being held up, either at the border or in uh, Karachi, um, and obviously it's had a huge impact on on trade, but. You know, in Afghanistan, you know, uh, what's extraordinary about the Afghans is they can make things happen. I mean, we don't have shortage of anything in the country despite these problems and these challenges. But these are challenges that we've had for a long time. And what the, the, the trade deal between Afghanistan and Pakistan, although technically as a sort of landlocked country, we should get goods uh, free of tax. We've had challenges with the Pakistani government for a decade now over these sorts but of issues. That, that trade agreement, which was something that Richard Holbrook was really mm -hmm. pushing, <clears throat> I mean, what was the purpose of the trade agreement and what has it actually achieved? Well, I think on paper, I think that everything's okay. The problem is just in terms of the practical, you know, day-to-day -day things uh, that we have, uh, we have had issues. But I suspect that these issues will keep going for a long time. I mean, we can't uh, import anything from India directly. It has to come by Iran because of this, because the Indian goods cannot go through Pakistan, for example. But even our goods going through Pakistan to India, which is such a big, mar important market for us, especially for our dried fruits, it should really take two, three days, but can take up to two weeks or three weeks, or sometimes never get there. And especially if you're talking about perishable items, it has a huge impact on, on, on our economy in terms of our exports. My name is Jack Pagano. I've been in Afghanistan for five years. I work at ISAF as a CAT team, and I worked at the Government Media Information Center. I taught hundreds of journalists television. And I keep in touch with them. I'm back here now on a new project on the insider threat problem, which right now that's on the bubble. So the question I, I ask you is how are you getting that information to the public about insider threat because most of the students I've trained, they think that that is a big problem. If another incident occurs, the house of cards could crumble. How does Tolo TV communicate the message to the masses? To make in them in terms of in, in, insider attacks uh, with, <coughs> with the military or with everything? Well, the insider threat that's happening green on blue right now. You know, we're, we're also victims of insider attacks, uh, you know, Afghan, Afghan government officials have been killed by insiders. Um, uh, and I, I think that almost every organization has been infiltrated by someone, inc you know, potentially including us. And we have a fairly elaborate s system of gauging who comes in for job interviews and how we do background checks on them. It's, it's, a, it's a combination of things. I think that you know, uh, one of the problems we've had, and, and uh, the president has talked about this, is, is uh, uh, Afghan government officials at the highest level affiliated with the governments uh, around us, whether it's Pakistan, Iran, or the Central Asian republics, or even Russia. And it's, that's a reflection of, of, of people wanting to survive. Um, in, I, I recall in 1977 or 76, when my father was a diplomat, a colleague of his was forced to resign because his cousin married a Pakistani national. No Afghan official was allowed to go into an, another embassy for anything without uh, permission of his uh, superior. 
those things will fall into place. I think that we will slowly but surely get to that in, in due course. In terms of green on blue, I think that, you know, I mean, it's the Afghan National Army is a very rushed job. I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, we don't have everything the, in place. What is green on blue, just to clarify? It's Afghan, Afghan uh, uh, police and, 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 and military and, 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 and other types of uh, officers or soldiers, foot soldiers, attacking their trainers or uh, foreign, foreign troops that they work closely with. Which has been on the rise, and it's 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 probably cost more lives in terms of international forces of late than. Uh, it seems like it was it's tailed off though recently. Is that because of um, better safeguards that are in place? I believe so, but also I think that you know we have to ensure that when we recruit people, that we do proper background checks on people. Uh, we still don't have a proper ID system. You know, we 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 don't have a huge database. Uh, I mean, they're building these in time. But the, Saad, wouldn't the U.S. military have, uh, you know, um, <coughs> retinal scans and, and other kind of data on millions and millions of Afghans that could be put in such a database? I think they've done it on, on suspects, certainly, of people yeah. arrested. But in terms of being, people being recruited for the, for the military, I know that for the police, they started doing that. But one of the challenges they have, again, is the Afghan government. Because the Afghan government is scared of, of uh, a huge database and an ID card system where they can... Um, you know, because of the elections and voting and everything else, sometimes a transparent system is not something that would uh, suit everyone's purpose. So for that reason, we, we, we have had challenges. But again, we'll get there. I think that this is, these are, you know, we f face these sorts of challenges and under the circumstances, I mean, they can adapt fairly quickly. And as, as Peter pointed out, I think that we've seen the number of green on blue attacks come down significantly since about three, four months ago. Gentleman over here. Hello, Richard Lee Smith from the British Embassy uh, covering Afghanistan here. I was also out in Kabul previously. Um, there's been quite a lot of interest in your programming that involves voter participation and um, the extent to which that might encourage cross-ethnic support for, um, I don't know, in your case, I, I imagine it's singers and, th and things like that. Do you have any sense whether that's happened as a result of... Um, some of your, your programs, whether you're actually getting um, people voting across ethnic boundaries or, or, or not? Well, I mean, we have a number of challenges. The biggest challenge is not security, it's apathy. Uh, if mm. people see a flawed process and their vote's not really counting for much, they will not vote. So voter participation, you know, we can do all the promotion we want, but it also depend, uh, much will depend in terms of the transparency of the process itself. Um, so one of the big challenges we have going into 2014 is convincing people that things are going to be different to 2009. But we have different. Pro we have a program called the Candidate, which is essentially like the American Idol, but it's to, you know to do with young people running for office. They have to come in with a set of policies, and they have to like promote their policies, give speeches, and then people vote for them. The public votes for them. Mm. As far as uh, you know, one of the things about Afghanistan, the sort of the ethnic groups and so forth. I mean, Afghanistan, we, we, we are no Yugoslavia. I mean, it's, it's, I have to point that out, that um, Afghans of all ethnic backgrounds uh, in different parts of the country, uh, we've seen them come out and vote. Uh, the Pashtuns in 2004, the Hazaras in you know, 2004 and 2009. Um, so the voter participation, to a large extent, depends on on how credible they feel the elections are going to be. I mean, in 2009, the biggest, I mean, we, we, the biggest fall in terms of voters was in Kabul. Um, and, you know, of course, the south and the east, you could, you could say because of security. But Kabul was because of people just didn't feel that it was going to matter. In back here. I'm Ed from American University. Uh, what were Soviet expectations when they invaded uh, Afghanistan? Is too much diversity? What, what, what was their expectation? I wish I knew. Uh, I, th I think <laughs> they, they got conned into invading the country. Uh, I mean, obviously, they had designs on the country, and they had uh, they probably had th uh, those designs for f uh, for three or four decades before they invaded the country. But I think that they they probably felt it was going to be no different to Central Asia in terms of um, 
uh, changing, transforming the country. But actually, I mean, I mean, if you look at, if you read books like Afghansky and uh, Afghanis, Afghanis, Afghansi yeah. and others, I mean, they pretty much were conned by the Afghan Communist Party to go into the country, something they probably regretted as soon as they walked in. Follow up on that, you know, some people say, I mean, the Najibullah government, which followed the Soviet withdrawal, collapsed after the money kind of ran out. Mm -hmm. um, if sort of the money tap was turned off in the United States for some reason, in 2016 or 2017, um, that would clearly have a, a problematic effect on the Afghan National Army because the Afghan, there isn't enough revenue to pay for the army and the Afghan budget. No, I mean, it's about six times the annual budget, uh, six or seven times. But also the size of the army is important. I think this, this whole idea that we're going to actually reduce the number of Afghan police and, uh, and militaries is a, is a flawed approach. Because? Well, I mean, you know, as soon as they get better, we're going to start reducing the right. number of Afghan soldiers, and it's ridiculous. The lady in back. Can you wait for the microphone? Uh, sir, I wanted to know your opinion um, on the balance of the international handoff and the continued humanist humanitarian assistance need. My question is based on my experience with the APPF transition. So your president Karzai's decision that um, we could no longer have foreign funded private security, which definitely brought many of the development initiatives to maybe not a halt, but foundering stage in our ability to perform because we suddenly couldn't have security. Um, I, I want to know what you think of that decision by your president, that, that private security companies were no longer allowed to provide for development workers in your country when we're trying to finish programs and keep things moving forward. Was that a, a good or a bad decision, in your opinion? Well, like most things in Afghanistan, there is no simple answer to that because you can see it from his point of view that you have you know, armies of... of, of, of uh, security types in the country, very expensive, large portion of your budgets are going towards security. Are they effective? Well, I mean, it, I, ha I have doubts in terms of their effectiveness. Uh, are they, uh, their behavior provocative? I would say yes it is, more often than not, especially in smaller communities where they go into. Um, can the Afghans do their job? I think they can. I mean, we've always had Afghan, and we're a big target. Uh, would be bigger target than most NGOs in that country. They protect protect us well enough. Um, so I think that maybe the decision to I mean I, th I think uh, the decision wasn't an abrupt decision. It, it had happened over a period of months. But it's one of the few things that I would I would say that I probably agree with the president. Um, I, I think that security private security forces. Uh, you know we we've seen a lot of bad things uh, these from are them. Western. They're Western, you know, they're, they're people who are not familiar with the culture, they're very expensive, uh, their behavior is very provocative. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if they do much good. Can the Afghans do a better job? I would say yes. Uh, and I think the NGO community needs to be very patient, needs to actually put a bit of effort into getting a cheaper security force that could help them complete their tasks. Um, you know, one of the concerns that we always have is, you know, I mean, a, an average employee of the UN on an annual basis costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, things like why should they have a very expensive security force? Why should they have a land cruiser that's armored? They can have a cheaper car. Why should they have a house in Wazir Rahan that costs $10,000 a month? So these are things that, you know, I mean, we really appreciate the money that the world is giving to Afghanistan, but could, could be better, better utilized. Well, in a sense, we've very generously given a lot of money to ourselves. I mean. If you look, I mean, I think Oxfam had an estimate of 40% of the money essentially was going back. I've seen figures. I mean, I think there are certain countries that do an incredibly good job mm -hmm. of actually giving the money to the Afghans. My impression is Sweden is very high at the list. You know, the United States does a very poor job of actually delivering aid in a meaningful way. And you could make the argument it would have been better if we just taken, you know, 20% of the aid and just given it to individual Afghans. It would have done more good. Yeah, I mean, or, or the Germans have done a brilliant job. I mean, if you, there was a, a road project we looked at, so I think the first half was done by, the, by GIZ, 
formerly known as GTZ, the second half by USAID. Huh. The Germans did it for one-fifth of the price, yeah. and they completed it. The Americans couldn't even complete the project. Yeah, one thing I was always puzzled by driving around Afghanistan is the people working on the roads were Chinese. I mean, if you know, Afghanistan has a huge un unemployment problem. Why were there so many Chinese who were brought in to do these roads? It seems very puzzling. Well, that's a whole discussion in terms of the contracting environment, that a big company wins the contract. They subcontract to a regional player. It could be a Turkish company or a Chinese company, which then subcontracts to, to, to a local Afghan company. So ultimately, you may pay a million dollars a kilometer for, for the road, but what you get is a $50,000 a kilometer road. So they tend to, you know, I mean, there was a road that I think was funded by the ADB that collapsed and killed six people um, to Jalalabad. I mean, literally collapsed and half a dozen cars fell into it. So there have been many examples of, of, of uh, shoddy jobs. Um, but then again, I mean, it's been a difficult uh, journey for us all. I mean, I think that most internationals didn't expect to actually go in and develop this country from scratch. Um, and it's been a learning process. But that's just as we're learning, I think you're leaving, right? <laughs> well, speaking of the learning process, if you were to score the three biggest failures of the United States and the three biggest successes, what would they be? Well, I think the, 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 the biggest success was actually the collapse of the Taliban regime and allowing the Afghans to come back in. That, that's been a big success. The, the process itself, I mean, people talk about Pakistan, that this government is going to complete its term for the first time since 1940-something. In Afghanistan, we've had two parliamentary elections. We're on our third presidential election. We've had an interim period, transitional period. I mean, you could argue that, you know, Afghanistan is unique in the entire region. So, you know, and there, there are no questions. You know, we know we're going to have parliamentary elections in the next number of years. We're going to have presidential elections. That's a huge success for us. Um, and three, I think that, you know, and I'm a bit biased about this in terms of the media uh, landscape in the country and telecommunications, the Americans played a significant role, not just in terms of creating the environment, but also helping people like us. Um, so these have been three big successes. The failure, I think the biggest failure has been uh, uh, not continuing to engage f fully post-2004, mm. distracted by Iraq. I think that there's huge opportunity cost, not just for Afghanistan, but for, 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 for America and, and the region. Um, I think the second, um, if you were to call it failure, was uh, the good use of your money, of your billions of dollars. It could, be, could have been better utilized mm. uh, for the country. And I think in, in absolute terms, things have improved dramatically, but relative to what you could have done with the money, we could have seen a lot more. Um, and the third one, one is uh, a mistake which we're, begin we're seeing happen is uh, not engaging post-2014. Mm. Um, sort of a myopic approach to foreign policy in a place as crucial as Afghanistan. The neighborhood, given its importance, I think will be a big mistake. We're seeing it happen as we speak. And I hope the third mistake is not, not going to happen, but I'm sort of fearful that it's just, they're going to throw it into the too hard basket and walk away from it. This lady over here. <coughs> My name is Jessica from American University. Um, what do you see as some of the biggest misconceptions in the American media about the situation in Afghanistan? And do you work at all with any mainstream U.S. news sources to kind of rectify that problem or inform the media here? Well, um, I think that, you know, with the things we talked about, whether it's education, urbanization of the country, in terms of how normal things are in Afghanistan, the development of civil society, of media, of, of, of the economy, which a lot of people believe that, you know, Afghanistan is just so impoverished, so backward. Uh, these are all misconceptions that we have to deal with on a daily basis. I mean, we know all the big media players in Afghanistan, the reporters and the journalists, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, um, you know, good news is not really newsworthy. Um, but also I think that we've, uh, our mistake, uh, us as in Afghans, has been the government, our government has, has failed to really communicate uh, the good things which have happened in, in the country. And I think since 2009, since our last elections, our president has locked horns with your government. And, and, you know, and we come across as a, a thankless uh, 
a bunch of people whose country has not really improved or changed. That's not true. First and foremost, I think people are very appreciative of what's happened in the country and very mindful of, of the importance of the international community. Um, and secondly, as I, as, as I mentioned, that uh, the, the people don't agree with the president on the issue of uh, international engagement as poll after poll indicates. Meaning that they are more sympathetic than the President Karzai has appeared to be. Yes. You know, one data point that um, you know is kind of astonishing: life expectancy has gone up 18 years in the last decade, from 45 under the Taliban to 62 for women mm -hmm. uh, for men and 64 for women. It took the United States between 1900 and World War II to get the same equivalent jump in life expectancy, and this is something. The story. I mean, that is. I, I just. You know, it's unreported. In, the, in America, and as you say, Saad, you know, I'm in the news business. I know, you know, we don't report on hurricanes that become tropical tropical storms. We report on tropical storms that become Hurricane Sandy. So that you know, that's just the nature of the news business. But the fact is, is that there, I think there is a rather distorted view of Afghanistan because it's mostly bad news that we see on the front page if we see anything. Well, that life expect expectancy is very important because they've dealt with child mortality and. Uh, and that's where, again, the, the U.S. government as well as the internationals have played such a positive role in terms of ensuring that um, you know, there's medical care around the country. Um, and again, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very challenging environment, but you see the results have been um, mind-boggling. You know, how quickly they can actually go up from 40-odd to 60-odd in terms of life expectancy. Gentleman on your left, Daniel. Sir, so Steve Heffington with the uh, Afghan Hand Program. I had a discussion back in uh, late 2010 with some senior folks from the high Ministry of Higher Education and uh, Kabul University um, regarding the, uh, the, the, the production of students coming out of Kabul University in higher education. Um, question I have is, <clears throat> at the time of the discussion, the, the answer I got was there was no strategic plan for how many students of what type were produced by any higher education system within Afghanistan, and that really the only way that they picked how many students they're producing was the size of the building they were using or the number of teachers they could get. Um, are you seeing any, uh, um, one, is the, 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 the higher education system within Afghanistan producing uh, the, the type and the numbers of, of people that you need to support or businesses within Afghanistan need to support continued growth? And two, are you seeing any kind of public-private um, partnership between the, the, the higher education system and the, the business community to uh, engender that kind of development? Well, it's a good question because it's, uh, it's uh, just to just go back to the basics, a few years back we, uh, some, of the, some of the Afghans that we dealt with in the government, we talked about the vision for the country. So let's say in 2030 or 2040, what will Afghanistan become? Will we be a, 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 an agricultural hub for the region? Will we be the banking hub? Will most of our people go and work in the Gulf as electricians or carpenters? So the educa education system to a large extent needs to reflect um, the, the, the future of the country within the region itself. So do we have to uh, establish vocational training centers? Do we have to establish um, new universities, agricultural universities? So I think that's, that's one area we failed. And I think this is an area that the, the, the international, our international friends can help us with. As far as the pr practicalities of day-to-day uh, -day business for us is concerned, we are dealing with, say, the American University in Kabul in terms of their faculty that deals with communications and media. We are working with uh, Kabul University. Uh, we are giving scholarships. and we, we have interns from the university who come through. We give them a small salary. And then when they finish the university, they come and work for us. We send out teams to different universities around the country. We try to engage them as uh, as much as we can. Uh, we believe, uh, as far as our, the future generation of Afghans are concerned, they're very talented. Uh, I mean, extraordinarily so, and uh, very, very enthusiastic, very aspirational. So, you know, they are the future of the country. So we want to engage them at so many different levels, and we're trying our best. But more could be done from a policy perspective, I would, I would say. This lady here. My name is Raga Al Sadi. I'm a congressional fellow, and uh, my question is that um, I'm assuming that the U.S. Um, relationship with the Afghan government is moving forward 
post-2014 will be more um, of a partnership relation. And uh, with that, um, more development and um, funds will go through uh, the capacity building and development for, uh, for the society. So what kind of conditionality that could be in a place in order, without offending, of course, the Afghan government, but to hold it accountable, as well as the U.S. taxpayers would make sure that um, the money is well utilized for on behalf of the Afghanis. Um, thank you. Well, that's one of the challenges. Is, is it's hard to ensure that the money that you're giving to the Afghan government is not stolen. Uh, and uh, I, I would say that this is where the private sector comes in. Um, as much as we like to see the Afghan government more engaged, there's no reason for the private sector not to be engaged. If it's building a dam, why does it have to go through the Afghan government? It could be actually given to a private company, tendered. The Afghans could be involved, as they are today, like with the mining industry. The Afghan Ministry of Mines works very closely with the DOD and uh, the World Bank and others in terms of uh, tendering various concessions. And as a matter of fact, people are fairly pleased with the results. Uh, so I think that there is an argument that, the, that uh, individuals within the Afghan government who, and uh, we have some good ministers and we have some good bureaucrats, can work with, with our international friends to create um, the framework through which uh, assistance is actually, not assistance, but development projects happen. In an accountable way. In an accountable way. I mean, I, I, you know, uh, you know, accountability is an issue is, is is a challenge for countries like Singapore and South Korea. So I think that this will this, it, we're not unique in that respect. It's the gentleman here, the lady. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ros Mason. I'm a resilience trainer, and I've been pleased to hear you mention on several occasions just now the resilience of the Afghan people. And I'm curious, to what do you attribute your own resilience and your ability to be someone? You, you stuck your head above the parapet, and I'm, I'm curious if you could explain you know, what ena has enabled you to do that and, and allows you to continue to do so. Well, you know, I mean, we're very lucky. I mean, we, we're in a very uh, good place. I mean, we have foreign passports, uh, myself and my siblings. We can get on a plane and leave the country. And for us, you know, we're not the ones facing um, problems, real problems. It's, uh, I mean, uh, ultimately, if Afghanistan was to falter, God forbid, it's the Afghan nation that's going to suffer. For us, we're going to have the easy option of being able to walk out ultimately. But for us, I mean, I, th I think we have no choice really. I, uh, for a lot of Afghans, they feel compelled to 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 persist. Uh, Afghanistan, and Tom Freston sitting before us, uh, lived there in the 1970s. I mean, we I listened to him for inspiration, and, and uh, when I want to hear about how what we can go back to, and ironically going back is a positive thing. <laughs> but um, so th there is, there, uh, you know, the people of Afghanistan um, are good people. I mean, I know that's a, it's not a technical term, <laughs> uh, but they're, they're good, decent people. As Kipling said, you know, we are the only nation in Asia that doesn't have an inferiority complex. We're comfortable being ourselves. Um, and if given the opportunity, I think they will they will prosper. I mean, you have to understand that we got involved in this mess as, as a pawn of, of the superpowers in the 1980s, um, and then neglected, hence the Taliban. Uh, we've had a good 10 years, good 10, 12 years, but I think that we just need time. I think that um, time will allow us to, to develop from within. It cannot be imposed on us, it cannot be forced. It has to be organic to a large extent, with some pushing some funding um, and you know and again you know we, we've been lucky that we've had a lot of support internationally and, and domestically um, and we've been lucky in more ways than one gentleman in the back here <clears throat> hi Jason Smith uh, International Executive Service Corps I was wondering if you could talk a bit about infrastructure particularly electricity telecommunications its impact on economic growth Maybe some ideas for progress. I don't have the numbers in terms of electricity, in terms of the you know the the demands of the country in terms of megawatts. But I know that in Kabul, 
most of the suburbs now have access to electricity at some stage during the day, which is a huge difference uh, uh, to 2001. For us, for example, we have our own generators, uh, which operate 24-7. But for the first time, we're looking to switch to the city grid. So that's a, it's off, you know, this is 2013. So, and we've been in the same office, uh, same offices since 2002. Um, and we import a lot of electricity from Central Asia. We've had a lot of uh, refurbishment projects in terms of rebuilding um, some of the old hydro plants. And we have a lot of mini plants which we've constructed around the country, especially in the north. And of course, some of the bigger projects like Helmand, I'm not even sure if, if that's going to actually end up producing any electricity. In Kajaki, the, in Dam. Kajaki Dam. I know that they've almost finished the work, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious thing for us. I mean, could the, could the industry develop without the electricity? Um, how could country, or the country enter the 21st century without, without uh, electricity? But what's interesting is that you know, we, we, we've discovered that we've, we have a lot more gas than we thought we did. So that's going to allow for uh, more plants to be built in the north. I know USAID is working with a number of companies to do that. And they've, I think they have a Chinese company now actually uh, working on the project. Um, but we need more help, obviously. And this is one of the areas that I think that the, the internationals can help. In terms of road infrastructure, I know that our roads are not the best, as we described, but it's more than we've ever had before. This is, this is what's extraordinary about Afghanistan, what we've built and how we've connected different parts of the country. And of course, we can't travel by road to s certain provinces and certain districts, but the road system that's been put in place is the best we've had ever. So a quick question. The, in late December, uh, when uh, Rasmussen, big US polling company, polled the American public, 33% of the country said, it, uh, you know, 33% of the people polled said the country's going in the right direction. Now, Asia Foundation, in their big poll la uh, late last year, found that 52% of Afghans think their country is going in the right direction. Do you think there's a problem with these polls? I mean, a lot of people say you can't poll in Afghanistan, or do you think these polls broadly represent sort of the underlying reality? Well, it depends on how you ask the question. Yeah. You know, uh, have you, do you have everything you've been promised? The answer is no. Are things as good as what you were promised in 2004? They will say no. But they say, well, if you look at the Taliban period, how, how has your life since then? It will say it's, a, it's, it's been a great journey, and we're very thankful. So it depends on how that, uh, that question is asked. I think that if you ask most Afghans to take a step back and to look at the, la uh, look at the last decade, they'll be more positive. But everything is relative to expectations. Well, you cited the, 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 the finding, which is pretty universal in polling, that only less than 10% of Afghans have a favorable view of the Taliban. You're confident that that's a pretty good number? I'm pretty confident that uh, that's a good number. I mean, you know, the government is, is unpopular. Um, and in some parts of the country, the people sort of uh, reminisce about the Taliban days. But there's an old adage that, you know, oppositions never win, governments lose. So it's, it's mostly a reflection of the weakness of the Afghan government than the, than the Taliban uh, being more popular. Any other questions? Just two here, yeah. On the economy after we, 2014, take yourself to 2020 or 2050, whichever is easier, and list to me where the Afghan economy, what are the, what are the biggest industries and where will the economy see its growth? Top three, top five. Well, agriculture is going to be a huge part of our future. Ninety uh, percent, as far you know, if you look at Afghanistan today, ninety percent of our economy is agriculture. So for us, the important thing is how to, you know, food security is a major issue in our neck of the woods. Whether it's the Saudi Arabians or the Kuwaitis or the Qataris investing in Africa and different parts of the of our region, Central Asia, for example, in terms of ensuring that they have enough food. Um, I think Afghanistan could play a, a significant role in the region. You know, we're the size of France with a population of 30 million people. If you look at Pakistan, it's got 180 million people, a much smaller country. And we have enough water in the country, but it has to be managed well enough. And I think this is where we need, again, foreign investment in terms of not just developing the agricultural sector, but in terms of value-added uh, industries, packaging and so forth. And there's a huge market for us in India and in, in, in the Gulf. Even in Europe, uh, you know, we're only five, six hours away from Europe. Um, and so we, we have this opportunity. Uh, it's going to take time. And this is one of the regrets we have that 
this sector wasn't developed well enough. I think the other area which is, which is interesting is because, uh, you know, it, we have still a small government relative to a lot of other countries that from a regulatory, uh, as far as the regulatory environment is concerned, Afghanistan can actually uh, change fairly quickly. We can have fairly liberal banking laws, for example, allowing banks to come and establish in the country. Uh, we could become the electricity hub of the region, importing from different parts of the region and re-exporting. Uh, to South Asia, a plan that the ADBs worked on. Once we have the grid and we have the infrastructure, which they're working on. So we, there are different things that we can do. Manufacturing is expensive, obviously, because we're landlocked and we don't have uh, railways. And of course, last but not least, uh, is the resources sector um, that needs to be explored, exploited, um, where Afghanistan seems to have significant reserves of natural gas, potentially of oil, of different uh, minerals gold, copper, coal. There's a gentleman here. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Doyle from American University. Um, one thing I noticed is when you mentioned a you know, sharply rising literacy rate, if you have a younger, a younger generation that's uh, getting some opportunities that the previous one did not, uh, do you expect any generational tensions and uh, a possible threat to sort of national uh, cohesion as a society as a result of a generational gap with things like literacy, opportunity, things like this? Yeah, I would suspect that we will, we will see that. The power of the purse will, has already transferred to the younger generation of Afghans. In most households, it's the young individuals who basically finance the entire family and they will demand more. Uh, you know, there is a lost generation, the generation that in the 80s and 90s were in refugee camps. Um, a, lot, a lot of them seem to be in power and in government and in the different ministries, but I think we will see that transformation happen fairly quickly. As to whether we have tension, you know, I think, I, I don't think that the tension is going to be that significant, but certainly they will play a much more active role in politics and business and culture. We're seeing that on the cultural side, but I think you'll see them more in politics and business as well. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Saad for a really brilliant presentation about Afghanistan's future of politics, economics, and uh, 